Man, I really hope this episode's not too long. Although I'm sure it'll be verbose, as always, Mike does tend to bloviate. Well, I guess we should just get on with it and talk about Deep Space Nine, Season 5, Episode 4, whatever the heck it's called. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Ooh, we're already macaraining. Oh, wow. So exciting. How's it going, Mike? It's going oh, well. Today, today we're talking about yep. season four, episode, season five, episode five. Nor the battle to the strong. This intro has indeed been a battle, and we've proved ourselves <laughs> not so strong. None of that was right. It's season five, episode four. Uh... <laughs> you just kept saying five. You just kept the number five. Five. There's five. There are five lights. I right, think you, we you should just accept the fact that we came up with a bit very quickly and it wasn't a complete failure. So that is a win. I'm doing good, man. It's uh, rainy, but and things are busy. Yet we got to watch Deep Space Nine with the friends last night. I put it up there for the free feed. So if anybody wants to know kind of how the watch-alongs go every episode, you can check out our Patreon on patreon.com slash KNDM. It's this one episode's not behind the paywall. I wish we'd had a maybe a better one for you, but nonetheless, it's for you there for you. Interesting. Uh, but you can uh, you can get in. We appreciate everybody who stopped by. Good group of friends. I'm doing good, Keith. Excited to talk about this episode with you as a writer. Mm-hmm. Should be interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, first off, it's going to be interesting because I think I like this episode a great deal more than you do. Uh, but we're going to get into that. But I have, uh, but before before we get into it, and before we get into your viewer ratings for uh, looking for Parmok in all the wrong places, uh, I have a bone to pick. With who? With uh, I, I have a bone to pick with two things. One, with the lady who came to the house. Uh, to pick up eggs that weren't hers at 6.30 a.m. this morning. Well, that is prime egg time. Uh, she didn't take it from the chickens. She took it from the cooler. Uh, but, uh, of course, big old dog goes crazy mm. uh, 6.30 in the morning. I had to text her like, hey, uh, don't ever do that. Yeah. Uh, but, all right, but here's my other thing. Okay. So I watched the... Uh, I watched the watch along. Because I, I think, for me now, my plan is to have my second viewing of the episode, if it works out time-wise, to be watching you watch the episode. Because okay. I think it's really fun, and it's really fun to like- You don't want to engage. The... You're just secretly watching to judge. No, no, because no, I'm not watching it live. Oh, well, okay. I'll watch it like the next morning. All right, all right. No, no I'm not like creeping on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and I'd love to hear what all of you, the patrons who can access this amazing footage at patreon.com slash KNM, have to say, however, I got a bone to pick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the patron. And I'm and this week, it's not always you, but this week I'm talking to you, JD. My friend, my good friend, JD. If you tease mm. any more spoil spoilers, I'm going to come to Texas and slap you right in the face. I saw the that. The whole point of the whole point of this series, right? The entire reason we're doing this series is because everybody watching this, other than Mike, desperately wishes- Maybe in the world. In the world, desperately wishes we could experience this all again for the first time. And if Mike has stuff spoiled for him, not only does he lose the experience of, uh, the joy of experiencing all this for the first time, including all the crazy plot twists and spoilers, but we, also lose watching him do that and clawing back ex- a little bit of the joy that we had watching it for the first time. So, do not tease any little spoilers for Mike, even if you, even if it's clever and you think he won't know. Mike's a bright guy. Don't even touch it. Now, see, Don't this, give JD, this spoilers is where... for coming later in the episode. Don't give spoilers for next season. Don't give spoilers for stuff this is setting up. 
Keep those mouths quiet. See, Stay in the present. You're getting the full Keith now because I have, I still I have <laughs> nothing was spoiled. I have no idea what JD was talking about, but I did see where it could have been I- interpreted. But let me also tell you, when this mm-hmm. all started, mm-hmm. all right, this whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. My role was, and this is starts even with toys. My role was as sheer observer, just so that Keith wasn't completely alone. <laughs> I'm just so lonely in the basement. Don't like, take this from because me. Because the podcast is just a little sadder if it's just Keith talking about Star Trek episodes, though probably fascinating also. And somehow it is morphed into I am a catalyst and a vessel through which people are recapturing and rekindling their childhoods. That and is the entire point of the series. I know, and now and now I feel the pressure. I can't read anything. If anything pops, no. and, you know, the algorithm, let me tell you, and I'm not even kidding, the uh. algorithm is trying so hard to F this up for me. So I have to, like, I, and I do it. As I'm reading through my scrolls, I, like, I, I'm like this. If I see a picture of the Defiant or a picture mm-hmm. of Avery Brooks, I'm like, scroll, scroll, scroll. It's, it's very stressful. In fact, we just got news this week that they are... Sh- they are going to end Lower Decks with season five. Uh, and I instantly was like, oh, I want to go and just like binge it because I want to show my support. But then I'm like, I can't do it. And I'm yeah. like, how far did Keith say I could watch? I got to go back to the episodes to see how far I should go. It's stressful. Yeah. But that is the whole yeah. point of this. And thus, I must see it through. Yes. And so it's everybody. Every I don't, I'm not picking out one person. It's, it's everybody. In the, in the comments, I thought you were coming for me because I do I do love to tease you because you're not there at the watch along, so I do like to throw in my uh, some 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 not so slight digs. <laughs> oh, I mean I, I mean I think I peeled off your face about three episodes ago, so it's, it's <laughs> I'll, I'll cut you some slack this time. <laughs> All right, so let us, uh, now Now that we've, it was the chicken lady. She woke me up at 6.30 this morning and then texted me. Did she wake up the gray chicken? That later. you were, that was, I, I'm, I, ass, no, I assume you bring no. it into bed at these times. Oh, of course, obviously. Yeah. No, here's the deal. My, my father, we've got all these chickens, right? And of course, like, you know, they make eggs. And, uh, and so I can't eat like 20 eggs a day. Uh, my heart would explode. Mm-hmm. So he he sells the eggs to his friends, like sells them. He sells them at a, as a loss, but he basically just gives the, the eggs away to his friends. And he usually delivers them, but because I'm here, we just put a cooler on uh, under the deck and like come you know come get them and self serve and pay for the things. But there's like a feeding frenzy for these damn things because they're amazing, like super crazy fresh eggs. And so they're supposed to text me and say, hey, what do you have available? Make an appointment. Come. It's like, okay, I've got three cartons of oil. You can have that. Whatever. This chaotic monster, like, I've already, like, Hmm. the next four days of eggs I've already spoken for. She just comes in, like, at 6.30 in the morning and just takes what she wants, wakes me up, then texts me 15 minutes later. I just barely fallen back asleep. Get a text, 6.45 a.m. I want want more eggs. I will. So yeah, all right. So that's the energy. I'm so bringing Farmer to the show Keith, today. not never yeah. was an al- al- alternative life path for you. No, <laughs> no, no. Six thirty a.m. is not a time. It's late night. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so let's t- let's talk about last week's episode. Looking for Parmok in all the wrong places. And here are what you had to say. Now, if you would like me to read your comment, Mike, there's two ways you can do that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> that's that's my cue. Keith and I yeah, are very Spoiler alert. Yeah. You can always drop us a super tip in the YouTube. I think there's a button. Mm. It probably says super tip or something. something uh, just super do that. thanks, I think. Yeah, super yeah, thanks. Something like that. Uh, if you do that with any denomination, I believe, a dollar or up, uh, Keith will read your comment. Depending on how much you tip, we'll will dictate how f- fervently he he reads it that that's mm. i'm just saying that now I'll, I'll reserve you some eggs yeah he'll, and he'll yeah. throw it dramatically at you if you come before 9 a.m or <laughs> right. you can always join the patreon all of our patrons get their thoughts read here on the youtubes and on occasion if we check the patreon if the if the comment gets left there we'll read it here it's a whole thing it, there's no science to it it's more of an art and by art i mean really haphazard yeah All right, so Joshua Cronin says, Yay, you finally got to the episode of the figure I made for you, Mike. He's still doing really well. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. If you weren't watching the toys version of the show, uh, Mike had talked about how he liked this. And uh, and so Josh made him 
a Klingon quark. It's a fantastic figure, and uh, it made an appearance in both versions of that episode. Speaking Super of cool. speaking of things that I've manifested, Keith, you hmm. have the boot shiv wharf, right? I do. That, but I mean, like, truthfully, that's mine, right? I mean, it's. I mean, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. I that's believe. fair. That's fair. Yeah. Josh continues, I enjoy this episode. I think Rilke is beautiful and the love story of her and Quark. Always enjoy interspecies relationships. And the start of Jadzia and Worf. I love so much. Ah, love this 93 self-sealing stem bolts. For me, side note, now I want to see your uh, what your brother-in-law looks like. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Eric. Uh, oh, I was just like... Trying to figure out, like, oh my god, trying to remember what happened last week. Oh, yeah, uh, did, did turn on your TV, he's on there all the time. His name yeah. is Eric Morris, you can check him out on IMDb. All right, so, I mean, he's uh, like, Jason... I mean, like, he's okay. Yeah, yeah whatever, yeah, yeah, it's not intimidating like, to, not like, like do any family function. like, you know, handsome or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's yeah. not like I want his life, I want to, like, wear his skin as my own. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, glad that's on the internet. <laughs> All right, let us all do a patron prayer that Eric doesn't watch the show. <laughs> Eric, well, I know you nothing... want to be supportive, and you just, like, hop in on, like, one episode to try to be like, you know what, I'm just working really hard on Cut this. I to want to me support my court. buddy. He's been missing for a few days, and I'm just like, I, I swear, it was just a bit. It was a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I thought you were the victim. What are you doing sitting in the... <laughs> of course, in the show, he's <laughs> playing me in court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you wearing his face. <laughs> I didn't do it, I promise. Oh god. We've gone too far. <laughs> now <laughs> too far? <laughs> We're gonna have to restart this whole freaking episode. <laughs> the season just is just already in the mail. Oh my god. It's being hand delivered by the chicken lady. Woo! <laughs> At 6 30 a.m. Ooh. All right. Uh, whew, there we go. Uh, YouTube, YouTube viewer is already writing an email. This was too uh, long. This is too long. <laughs> we should put chapters in just not for wrong. YouTube viewer. Not wrong. No, not wrong at all. Jason Moe says, I'm going to start being less verbose in my comments. So Keith has a little bit less to read every week. If only we would be less verbose in our comments. Mm. As a middle-aged man with a dad bod, not very dissimilar from Kalamini's. And me too. I would love to believe that Kira would fall in love with me in the situ- Oh, do- would I love to believe that Kira would fall in love with me in the situation? Yes. Yes, I do. Do I believe it? Uh, no. The Kira O'Brien thing made no sense when I first saw the episode in the 90s, and it makes even less sense to me now due to the zero romantic chemistry between these two fine actors. Keiko is also shockingly oblivious to what was going on the whole time. I much prefer Mike's suggestion that it would have worked better if Keiko was into it too. All that said, this episode is a fantastic showcase for Armin Shimmerman's incredible talents. 80. Dembolts. Keith, may yeah, I insert into start. the record for the show? I will speak for the show in that mm -hmm. the lack of chemistry there, I do not believe is physical, right? That is not because Colm is in a different league physically. I'm not shame, body shaming Colm at all. I just didn't buy the romantic chemistry betwixt the friends. But just, but naturally, I think chemistry is sort of just a natural thing, right? Uh, it is there or is not. There's no. I've know plenty of couples who are of different body types that are quite happy and into each I'm other. I'm desperately so. hoping to be in one someday. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to. I want to throw that out there. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Maynard stuff comes in with an 87. Welcome, awesome. Maynard. Yeah. JD says so. Last night I was watching your video on my desktop. I made a few humorous comments and notes, and as Keith was giving his stem boats spiel. The power went out. So I came back to watch the last five minutes and to say I give this one an 85 and block to whatever I was saying before. JD, I feel you because I have been out here in the boonies for a week and the power has gone out twice. Uh, once with a Guys, storm and then the Guys, $69, Amazon.com. Get yourself a battery backup surge protector. It buys you about 30 to 40 minutes after the power goes out to save your work and power down. Well, I have, well, I have, we have one for the uh, internet, but it doesn't work for the 
But we also, my father, we have a, an actual generator mm. um, that I, if it was going to be out for long enough, I could take it out and like we have like a bypass on the uh, on the the whole box and everything. It, but it's like a whole big thing. But like our transformer blue or something like that and so we had like seven different trucks up our, up the driveway here crazy anyway uh so i feel you we see uh harry pothead says 100 stem bolts this is a major favorite of mine kevin miles also up there with a 96 said this episode should have been called hormones you're not wrong carl fisher Welcome yeah, to Carl. the patronage. Uh, uh, I've been like enjoying reading your comments for a long time. It's so excited to be uh, to have you here on the team. Carl does what Carl I do, Keith, says, just to say he wrote us an email on the on the Patreon, and <clears throat> when he comes upon a couple a couple extra bucks, you know, or he had a good month or whatnot, this is what I try to do. I pick four or five of the patron or the podcaster thing the creators throughout the internet that I watch and listen to and have a Patreon, even if I don't really want their Patreon stuff, I try to throw them a subscription for a month or two, as long as I can, to uh, to show my support. I And that is tremendously appreciated, uh, for sure. And honored to be uh, on your uh, selection this month. Yeah, really. So Carl says, this episode was not the first time in 1996 that Armin and Phil Morris appeared on the screen with each other. In January of 96, they worked together as Stan the Caddy and Jackie Cheels in the epi- in the Seinfeld episode, The Caddy. Cool. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and Armin has a lot of feelings about his time on Seinfeld. For another time. Hibernation Pod gives it a 75. And, of course, the mysterious Anne and the mysterious household says, I love this episode and I appreciate it, and the ship too, even more after Keith's observation that Worf's acting this way because he's feeling shaky about his Klingon identity. I think that's spot on, and I love when Deep Space Nine does that subtle show-don't-tell character work over the course of several episodes. So satisfied. I wouldn't change a thing with the Keiko Miles Kira storyline and performances. I love that it's impossible to tell what's up with Keiko. My headcanon has always been that she knew from the beginning that things would get weird between Miles and Kira, so she made a choice very similar to the choice Dax makes with Worf's crush in this episode. Play it cool, let it play out, and trust that pushing them together will be more effective in the ending in ending the attraction than pulling them apart would be. I like that very much. Yeah, that's great. I, I think it's it it is by far the most like mature way that sort of understands human psychology and it speaks to trust right if if you trust your spouse if if first off you're in a monogamous relationship Mm -hmm. and you don't have an open relation but and you trust your spouse you know that even if they feel all the feely feels you can trust them and i think he, he demonstrates that he is worthy of her trust uh in how he handled this. Yeah, and that's, so, a, that's uh, a great point. Ex- the expectation that your partner in in said monogamous relationship would be asexual towards other humans for the rest of their lives is absurd. sort of asinine and absurd. Yeah, but the expectation that given those con- conflicting feelings or opportunity or temptation, they will make the rational decision based on the kind of rules you set for your relationship, I think is awesome and very apropos to a healthy marriage. Yeah, I, and that's exactly right. I think it is the healthiness is the is is the emphasis there because like you're you're 100 right. We feel what we feel. Our mm-hmm. biological feelings are our biological feelings, and like we can't magically turn it off. But we are responsible not for our thoughts and not for our feelings but for our actions you know and it's also tacitly she and brings up something we failed to sort of mention last week in exploring this and and it's interesting that they they add the color that because we it's such a human experience thing is that even the most healthy of relationships right are fodder for the general gossip right people who want to read into situations like that opening scene with Bashir and and quark People want to 
want to dramatize, want to make things salacious. Want they want to, to speculate. They want to water cooler stuff. Even even in our utopian future. Uh, today we, it, today we call this tea. I've learned yes. this from TikTok. Mm. Mm. It must be spilled. Mm, indeed, mm -hmm. it must be hot. So Anne continues. Whether that's what's going on or not, I love that Dax and Keiko are both shown as totally confident and in control. As you noted, most TV shows would have had them freaking out, attacking the other women, and melting into a pile of jealousy and insecurity. I love Kira and Grilka in this episode, too. Boundary violations on TV are usually just sweeps weaky and uh, really mess with my suspension of disbelief. This is one of the only examples I can think of where a show addresses a boundary violation, the lines blurring and almost crossing between Kira and Miles in a smart and realistic way, and in a way that would that where you can actually feel the weight of the consequences of what Miles is say is staying on the runabout would have been. Again, nuanced, satisfying, so real. 96 self sealing stem bolts. Uh, thanks everybody. I'd love this conversation. All right, so let us continue forward and talk about Nor the Battle to the Strong, Season 5, Episode 4. I got it right this time for the first time of this episode, which aired on October 21st, 1996. The top song continued to be... <clears throat> Lots riding on this, Keith. <laughs> there goes our monetization. Jake writes a story and he wears a real big coat. Bashir gets him in trouble, Daddy Cisco must now dote. The Klingons make him poop his pants, but in the end there's hope. It's the guy from Pee Wee I. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you realize you might have to do that now for every episode moving forward. The Macarena. <laughs> Yeah, there it is. The top movie this week was Sleepers, mm. which was a crime thriller starring Brad Pitt, Dustin Hoffman, and Robert De Niro that I have no memory of. I don't think I've ever seen it. Sleepers, but yeah. It's a, a pretty, uh, pretty intense cast. Speaking of intense, what was on TV tonight, Mike? Uh, nothing much to mention. I will say a couple of things, though, because this is what we're doing. Monday Night Football, the Oakland Raiders defeated the San Diego Chargers 23-14 to in Game 2 of the World Series, Keith. The Atlanta oh. Braves beat the Yankees 4 to nothing. It was, they were up two games to nothing and then went on to lose the series in five games. <clears throat> Ooh, spoiler alert. Yeah, sorry about that. Also, Guys, spoilers! Come on! Just because it jumped out, I know uh, I keep bringing up this Cosby Show thing, but uh, this night's, the title of this week's episode did not age well. It's called One Foot in Your Mouth. Yeah, I, yeah. That, and then how that, about, and thus about, ends my ever mentioning the Cosby again. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> Spend more than one foot in jail, please. All right. Uh, what was Voyager doing? Still off this week. Uh, but we're uh, we're continuing season three, which is when Voyager starts to pick up a little bit okay. in uh, in season three. So there we, you go. We, we like got did you notice there. a request for us to start Voyager during the run of this? Not gonna happen. <laughs> I, I took it a little more tactfully, but Keith gets right to the point. Well, hey, look, I, I would love it. Uh, I believe we're barely scraping the hours in the day to <laughs> yeah. do what we're doing. Already. And don't forget, uh, Strange New Worlds. Uh, quick, fast on its way of coming back. Yeah. Well. Oof. Well. 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 we'll, we'll Hopefully, figure it we out. stay unsuccessful, Keith, so that we have the time available. <laughs> yes. May we ward off success with YouTube shows. Okay. <laughs> the weekly world news headline. Uh, oh, I didn't. Got a it. lot of great prophecies, including. Hey, you know what? The Antichrist is alive today in the United States. Look out. There we go. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I, I could believe it. I 160 believe degree it. heat wave makes, makes, feels right. Tidal waves levels New York in 99. Okay, well, close. Armageddon mm -hmm. will start, how it will end. Iraqi terrorists release deadly nerve gas, killing millions. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, <sighs> Debbie, I didn't, didn't have any. All right, uh, Hard, like hard hitting, you know, like uh, political takes. views. <laughs> hot takes from 2003. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll get there during one of the shows. Yeah, that's true. 
All right, so uh, this episode was directed by Kim Friedman, who last directed The Ship only two episodes back. Kim was very busy at this point. This was written by Rene Echevarria, with a story by Bryce Parker, who uh, I believe this was a submission, and Bryce is a prolific visual effects guy, working all the way up to today, including the last Dune movie and Joker. Very interesting. I thought the visual effects were very good. Yeah, well, he wrote it, so I don't think had to do with that, oh. but it was still cool. I guess we talked about that, right? Like, at some point, they updated, because all the phaser and the rifle shots and stuff looked better. Yeah, well, that you know, we're, we're crossing the bridge from practical to more digital effects. No, the phasers have always been digital, of course, but uh, I think that the fidelity of it is, is going up as we're going, so pretty cool. All right, speaking of pretty cool, Mike... What do you say? We now keep waste your time with what? With, with what? Trivial trivia. Bow. The original idea of this episode. <laughs> I didn't do We're that on purpose. Get demonetized. <laughs> there goes a forty cents. <laughs> Why is Which that is literally what we make per episode yeah, on that's the ads. Pretty funny. Uh, so the original idea on this episode was that Jake, who has been established as an aspiring writer, would have experiences similar to those of Ernest Hemingway during World War I. Uh, and I definitely got a lot of World War I in this episode. The cave that Bashir and Jake leave from to retrieve the generator is, of course, from Bronson Cave just outside of Los Angeles. The same cave was used as a hidden entrance. Mike, you ready for this? To the Bat, Bat Cave, Cave. Yeah. in the TV show 60s? Batman yeah. in 1966. And this is the 100th episode of Deep Space Nine. Well, I thought that was Nine. a few weeks ago. So that means literally then, if we do one a week, that's two years of our lives have, have evaporated, Keith. Oh, no question. And it's our 101st episode because we did the pilot as two episodes. Right. So, 101 from our idiot faces. The uh, scene with Jake and Burke in the trench bears a striking resemblance to a scene from Lewis, from the Lewis Milestone film, All Quiet in the Western Front, uh, in 1930. Fantastic film, if you haven't seen it. The Netflix Um, remake of it is also excellent. The remake, the remake is is very good, but I I recommend. Go back and watch the original, because this was 1930. Uh, It's one of the first, it's early talkies, and it's pre-code. So it actually is strikingly darker and more realistic than films that would come out for the next 20 years after it. And uh, my parents, uh, we did this thing when we were kids, they showed us these classic movies, like once once a week, we'd watch one of these classics. And I always, every single time, like, oh, God, do we have to watch this old black and white, but it's so boring or whatever. And by the end, I was profoundly moved and affected by it because mm. it's this phenomenal movie. Same thing with the original King Kong. Definitely check it out. So yeah, if especially you haven't those, seen it, those films that it. they had to literally stitch the film together to edit it, which is always oh, appreciated. Yeah. I always think it's cool. And and you think it's 1930, the effects or what, what they would be able to do would be terrible. It's actually very impressive what they do in that film, if you go back and watch some of the battle sequences. All right, anyway, uh, Danny Goldring, who plays Burke, has previously appeared as Legate Kell in Civil Defense on Deep Space Nine, and would later appear as the Alpha Herogen Nazi Commandant in The Killing Game and The Killing Game Part Two on Voyager, the Nausicaan captain in Fortunate Son, and alien captain in the Catwalk on Enterprise. So, uh, also, after principal photography wrapped, director Kim Friedman found herself with an episode with an <coughs> the episode running three minutes short. And as such, Rene Echevarria had to create a new scene. And this new scene is the second scene with Jake and the shul- and the soldier who shoots himself in the foot. Ironically, after the scene had been written and shot, both Echevarria and Friedman came to feel it was the most thematically important scene in the entire episode. Um, and I completely agree. It's the mm-hmm. moment where 
Jake goes from looking at this guy with dis- disdain to be like, oh god, I'm exactly the same way. Uh, really, really good. So, in the original draft of the teleplay, the story is actually set in a Cardassian hospital on a planet under siege by the Klingons, which I think would have made a little bit more sense thematically. Both Jake and Bashir would have uh, come into conflict with a with the Cardassian women running the hospital due to their belief that the males are relatively inferior in the science and medical domains, and has and had been previously established in the episode Destiny. The primary reason this particular story was abandoned was budgetary, hmm. as the producers had discovered while shooting Apocalypse Rising, using a large number of alien extras was both time-consuming and expensive. And as they were trying to save money for the upcoming, I'm not going to say what it is, but it's kind of the gigantic episode this coming up this season, it was decided that another makeup costume intensive show was not the way to go. Uh, I totally get it from a time and budget standpoint. I definitely think it would have been better uh, done that way for two reasons. Um, One... I really like the the continuing the subplot of the Cardassian women being the smart scientists and and having sort of like the reverse gender stereotypes there. But also, I think that the Klingons battling the Federation when we've already somewhat wrapped up this part of it felt a little forced to me, whereas if we were rescuing Cardassians where the Klingons are still very much at war with, I think that would have rung a little it would have made a little bit more sense but anyway sometimes productions are productions so uh no matter what our budget looks like the only reason we have one is because of some very important people mike keith the people who complicate our taxes yeah are we gonna go to jail because we didn't really address that uh, we'll deal with it. Brian Kimball Beersock, Jason Moe, Peter Bank, Frank Rinch, Quark's Bar, Joshua Cronin, Ryan Chesley, Andrew Hayes, and the Mysterious Wharfs, Big Old Boochips, Charles Babbage, Harry Pothead, Allen, Anton Thies, Carl Fisher, CRM Productions, Nikolai Ivanovich, Lobachevsky, Delusions at Noon, YouTube viewer James Hubbard, JD Makes, Colin Dakin, Chris Mitchell, Pat, Joshua Cronin, and of course, JD again, Lutz and Wyatt Eldridge, and of course, the lovely, the beautiful, the talented, and the all-powerful Chancellor Jen. Mm-mm. They are the few, the proud, the patrons. And the fact that I can't know, I can no longer do that all in one breath is really humbling. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, we appreciate your financial support of our small little YouTube channel, as well as the things you send us in the mail so we have content. And uh, some people sending me in stuff in the mail just to help jumpstart my collection the whole thing is just sort of a mini dream you can be part of that team at patreon.com slash kndm keith and i are often full of shicky shick stickiness uh but today we just say a simple thank you and send our heartfelt appreciation to all of those who are able to spare some change every month to help support the channel for sure our guest stars this week include Andrew Kavovit as Kirby, Karen Austin as Calandra, Mark Holton as the Bolian orderly, as you recognize from Pee Wee's Playhouse, Lisa Lord as the nurse, Danny Goldring as Burke, and Broadway's Jeb Brown as the ensign. Uh, very young Jeb. Okay. Well, we'll talk about more. He, he, she just uh, he just did a play with Jillian. Oh, cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Jeb has done a million things. You've you've seen him in many shows. All right, so what do you say we hop into our screening room? Wow, there you go. Uh, did you see High Fidelity, Mike? Uh, I've listened to it quite a bit. I never saw it. I had an audition for it originally, so I, I became well-versed with the score. Wow. I I said it only, only ran 10 days on Broadway, but I did get to see it. And oh, he cool. was, uh, he, and Jeb played a, uh, like a, a creepy old uh, yoga guy. 
but Jeb, Jeb also was uh, in Beautiful. He was in Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark mm. as the uh, as the understudy for Norman Osborn Green Goblin. Also, Grease, uh, Ring of Fire, Aida, Bring Back Birdie, mm. the uh, ill-fated Bye Bye Birdie sequel, which only ran for two days on Broadway after opening and was a child in Cat in a Hot Tin Roof back in 1975. So there you go. So in our teaser, Bashir and Jake are headed home from a medical conference in a runabout. Jake has been shadowing Bashir for an article he's been assigned from a journal. It's his first gig as a writer. But Bashir is just bloviating endlessly. We hear a voiceover of Jake's thoughts or writing. It's the first time we've used this device on Deep Space Nine, and I think it's fantastic. Jake is distressed because the story that he's writing is going to be super boring, and he wishes there would be something more exciting. Life or death, you know? Well, would you believe? After all that, they are interrupted by a distress call. Klingons have landed troops on a remote planet. They need med medical assistance immediately. Bashir thinks it's too dangerous, but Jake wants to go, and he points out, I I'm an adult now. I can handle myself. So Jake has finally crossed the 18-year-old threshold here. Bashir reluctantly agrees, knowing that Ben Sisko is gonna be pissed. But Jake is excited. So in Act 1, on the station, Quark is showing the senior staff his new decaf rock to Gino, and it is predictably terrible. So much for Quark to Gino. Uh... Decaf anything is, feels like a waste of all things, but it doesn't really taste different. Yeah, but uh, can't the replicator kind of do anything? Uh, only if the pattern is stored in there. Mm. You know, like, they, it's, like it's, the story. It's probably like a freemium model, and they don't want to pay the you know two ninety nine to get that pattern. Give me decaf coffee that tastes like regular coffee. Bzzz. Okay. No, no. Would you like to subscribe for Replicator <laughs> Premium? <laughs> Damn it. Can I get a boot? <laughs> <laughs> You're using an Apple device. It's very hard to oh, put okay. bootleg software on yeah. the Apple device. All right. Yeah, well, there you go. You're telling me Quark, so, of, of all people, you know Quark's got that, uh... He's got, oh, he, for sure. he's got well, that but, uh, Plex server. <laughs> however, I'm going to fix this. Quark does not want to use that because he wants to create his new IP and then be the one selling it. You're right. Okay, fair. Also, this is where Mike brought up a point that I'm, like, it's growing a little, I think I actually mentioned this last week too, I'm growing a little weary of quippy prego Kira. Like, just because she's pregnant doesn't mean she can't be still be a badass. Like, can we have her do something more uh, interesting well, now? Yes. However, your desire for the story battle Kira pregnant is uh, is forgetting that Nana is actually human pregnant. Yeah, but she doesn't have and to go so, do stunts. That doesn't mean she, they can't give her something more interesting to do is what I'm saying. Well, yes, except for all of the interesting things that have happened in this time have been on location. Yeah, okay. In s some horrible hot desert or cave. Yeah. And she's like, I'm pregnant. No. Just make me sneeze and giggle a lot. There you go. She works. She comes in for like an hour a week. Gets You're right. A laugh, you know what? Okay, goes fine. Back. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. Why do you hate Nana? Why do you want to make her sad? No, I just want to see her skill set. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what you want to see. All right. So uh, O'Brien uh, continues to micromanage Kira's pregnancy, much like Mike. <laughs> they debate the rights of a pregnant woman who could possibly conceive of telling a woman what to do with her body. Certainly not a bunch of people without wombs. That must be some sort of a sci-fi thing. I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Cisco comes in seriously, and he's gotten a message from Bashir. The planet that they are going to rescue is a Federation colony that the Klingons are fighting to retake the Arcanus sector, which Yes, I think it would be better if it were on Cardassia, but Gowron did say in the season premiere, like, we're not done fighting out on these pieces on the Arcanus sector. Uh, but they're not going to get reinforcements for two days. 
and naturally Cisco is concerned. So Jake and Bashir arrive on the planet, and they're going to have to land the runabout and join the medical team in some caves after the hospital was destroyed. Bashir, more serious, warns Jake that this might get a little rough. But Jake is very confident. We like, arrive can I bring in my the big coat? In my big coat coming? No, no, it's staying behind? Okay. Yeah, no. You gotta, you gotta bring the coat. That's uh He doesn't bring the coat. Man, they, so many couches were killed for these uh for these coats. It's so big. So uh we arrive in the makeshift hospital in the cave set. There are wounded people everywhere, and a bullion runs triage. Bashir is called off to assist. There are bleeding battle victims and wounded children everywhere. Jake, understandably, doesn't know what to do. And he leans down to help someone, and a nurse says, it's too late. Literally dying in Jake's arms. Then Jeb Brown stumbles in with a bleeding foot. And he says, get out of here while you still can. The Klingons can't be stopped. Bashir examines him and realized that he wasn't stabbed by a Klingon, as he says. He shot himself in the foot to get out of the fighting. And we notice that he's wearing a darker uniform that we will learn later to be worn by Federation troops. Hmm. So they have a different battle uniform. And you, you've been asking for a long time, where are the, where are like the, the army guys? But their Here battle uniform has no Kevlar or anything like that? We just go like straight sweater? Don't worry about it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, Should we protect ourselves from the blasting? No. We need comfort. <laughs> we need breathability. I want some beautiful pajama sort of a feel to it. Uh, should it be, you know, maybe protected from like blade weapons because we're fighting the Klingons? Because like we, because we have that actually right now. We have like sort of mm -hmm. no, 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 blade no, proof, uh, uh, no, no. There's only one thing that is more important than all of those things, and it is anti-chafing. Yeah. Okay, no, I mean, you, I mean, yes, you can get stabbed for the heart, but what's the point in keeping your heart if you're chafed? If your nipples are red, yeah. Yeah, well, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so uh, Jake looks at this self-wounded soldier with a bit of disgust. Maybe the most 90s dot, dot, haircut dot. you could possibly get? I mean... I call it the Chandler kind of Bing. standard. Yeah, it's a standard haircut, but you see guys wearing that haircut all the time. All the time. It just feels... Take off your hat, sir. <laughs> no. Take off your hat and tell me you don't have exactly the same hair as Jeb. Right? Yeah, I just mean, pre pretend you Jeb shot yourself in the foot. Mike, what happened to you in the battle? Did you get cut by Klingons? No, nah, no, nah, I just ran out of some just for men. <laughs> I needed to get back to <laughs> I needed to get back to triage. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta triage this hairline, goddammit! <laughs> All right. Uh, we're stupid. We are idiots. The Bolian tells Jake to move away. So he finds a quieter place and tries to write, but he's understandably freaking out. Then he's called by a young orderly named Kirby to help him with a patient. Wait, that dude's name was the, Kirby? His name was Kirby, yes. The wounded man takes grabs Jake's shirt then collapses again leaving a large blood stain on Jake and that is the end of act 1 and i think in this act there's a very strong tone shift for trek mm -hmm. and trek battle stuff we almost never see blood on trek we almost never see bodies we never see bodies on trek and I've never seen anything like this ever on Next Gen, and we haven't seen anything like this on Deep Space Nine really yet. And so there's like, we're we're stepping into real war mm -hmm. and not sci-fi war in this episode. And I think that the that there is sort of a barrier we cross with the bloody hand on his chest, and like the it's like it's. In a lot of ways, I'll talk about it at the end, but like this episode is the end of Jake's innocence, mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways, it kind of is setting up the end of Trek's innocence, or at least Deep Space Nine's innocence in this episode. It was giving me, I mean, I think maybe it wasn't giving as strongly, we can discuss its effectiveness later. And I, you know, I am watching it now, right? I can see that in the time, 
watching it on, on network television at that time and you're comparing it to the previous treks, I can see where that tonal shift is a lot, a lot more apparent. You know, in the here and now, it's it didn't strike me as as shocking as, as shocking, it was. Which in I you know, it, it's definitely just because of when when I watched it. But also, you know, it's hard for me not to hold it, even though it came many years before, up to that episode of Strange New Worlds we watched last year sometime, and which it, which is very much thematically the same. It's kind of a remake of this episode. Yeah. So, you know, in that I felt, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher because the, that, the production of that allowed them to ground it much more. And that grounding allowed a visceral nature that I think it was necessary to break through to me. Whereas this, mm. it, it, it runs up, and, I, and I'll just a spoiler where I'm going with it. Yeah. It does so much right, but it runs up just against the production elements. It's hard not, some of the production elements make it feel a little hokey, right? Which remove that grounding which makes it difficult it like rides a fine line i'm not saying it fails it's just it ha it's up against it has got its back up against the wall if that makes sense yeah i mean i i think i think the context is king here mm -hmm. not to sound like mm -hmm. eric bischoff right because it didn't read as like i it's funny because I, I watched the rewind i watched you watch it and i watched you experience a lot of it as a little bit hokey and a little bit schlocky and a little bit um sort of done and i guess I, I guess because i watched it for the first time in context realizing that like even the blood and the gore of this episode are sensibilities as a culture in terms of seeing that in 1996 were so wildly different in terms mm -hmm. of how mm -hmm. much blood they i'm surprised that they allowed this much on television yeah, but didn't really, like two weeks ago we did that thing where they they were sick and Bashir was in the other place and they had the disease on the planet. There's disease, a lot of blood in but that. Not, no, they had sort of diseasey makeup. This is like blood and wounds. A lot of body, like the dead bodies here. I think is and the, the most dead bodies we've seen. and that kind of stuff. Like like if you think about like, uh, we're it's 1996, so we're at the tail end of 80s slasher movies. Right, and these are films, not television, and these are R-rated films, and they were the, the Jason films, the the Halloween films, right? They battled censors on gore mm. constantly through that entire time on knife stabbing somebody, blood spatter, whatever it was. They were fighting off X ratings constantly. We look at those films today, and you wouldn't even cut it for television. You'd show this at 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, you watch one episode of The Walking Dead. The average episode of The Walking Dead would be banned from cinema, not even just television, in the early 90s. Like, it would literally be illegal to show that. Even in an R-rated film. So, it was much more... All of this was much more shocking. And I think the, the grounding of that... That... Or... That... that happens because of context now it doesn't feel like oh what's the big deal like we see that all the time but then that was so shocking i think that did a lot of the work grounding this episode in context of the 90s i think so uh and it did for me in context of star trek so in act two later jake is now helping curvy carry stretchers of the wounded through the caves more time passes and jake is now dressed as an orderly they come across yet another dead soldier and carry him to the makeshift morgue that is also filled with bodies. Um, again, shocking image for this time. More time passes and Jake keeps helping them move the wounded. He becomes more and more covered with blood. Hours and hours have passed as they discover Bashir and the two doctors finally cleared of patients exhausted on the floor and you made the comment in the in the watch along that it felt like this sequence was a little long and i think it's very much intentional that of how like punishingly long and exhausting this whole sequence is so i think them taking an extra 30 seconds of this was important to the story to build that sense of exhaustion that sense mm -hmm. of relentlessness to this battling you know it's kind of MASH. We do an episode of MASH here a little bit. 
So back on Deep Space Nine, Cisco summons Odo to discuss an incident. Odo was trying to arrest some folks from cheating at Dabo when he was injured jumping off the stairs because he forgot he couldn't change into something that can fly. And Cisco says, it's an understandable mistake. You've been a changing changeling a lot longer than you've been a solid. Solid. I wonder why my people use that term. Humanoid bodies are so fragile. And in the stage directions, it says this simple observation strikes a chord with Cisco. Yes, they are. And it's a dangerous universe out there. Odo can tell that he's worried about Jake. And Odo says, try not to worry, Captain. It's not going to do you or Jake any good. Can't help it. Comes with the territory. And Odo says, but Jake is 18 years old. Your, does your father still worry about you? And Cisco says, all the time. This is such a great way to tie these two stories together that is both thematically appropriate, but also part of the larger story, including Odo's adjustment to being a solid. And I think uh, it, shows, was... it shows a subtle, not even subtle, it, it shows upon analyzation that the writer's room knows that when they have an opportunity with these two actors in a scene together, they can do a lot of subtext, right? They don't yeah. have to put it all on the page. It, it can be, the vibes are strong, right? We get, we get a lot here in just a great scene without having a ton of dialogue. Yeah, no, it's, it's really true. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's really well done and there's no, well, I think the writing of this episode is actually really good because there's no wasted couplet of dialogue. Everything matters. Everything, you know, even though we're talking about Odo, something that happened off screen, it's important to this whole story, both emotionally and practically. It also, like, brings up other little, it, like, shoots little sprouts of story, right? In that I had never even contemplated, you know, we, we kind of subtly hinted at and joked with, oh, what is Odo's experience now as a solid, as a human uh, being full, eating food, right. being tired, drinking booze. But like, we didn't think about the larger stuff. We haven't talked about it at least in this scene. He could father a child now. Yeah. Ooh, he that's could. That's interesting. Yeah. What, what, what does, because has he ever thought about being a father like that before? Because it seems like it's an idea he's now mulled over in this scene. It's something he's clearly thought about. He's like, I don't think it's for me. And it's it's interesting to see him have these sort of fledgling ideas for things he didn't, maybe didn't consider prior. Yeah, it really changes a lot. Both good and bad. Opportunities opened and opportunities closed. I'm so glad that didn't get spoiled for me, right? That he gets shifted from goo guy to solid. To not goo, yeah. yeah. So Dax comes in with some bad news. The Farragut, who was on its way to help the colony, has been destroyed. Mm. And the Farragut is not a random unknown ship. We have it seen sounded it. familiar. We see it in Star Trek Generations. Mm. Um, it helps, uh, oh, I, I, spoiler, I won't tell you what it does, but its previous namesake, because you know there are like a bunch of different enterprises, there's a bunch of different Farragut's, its previous namesake was the ship on Strange New Worlds that Kirk abandons every 30 minutes to hang out on the Enterprise. Well, there you have it. So, yeah. That's why you have that's why you've heard it so much. So, with this news, Cisco springs into action. They're going to take the Defiant and go for a rescue mission, but they're 3 days out. Which is weird to me that they wouldn't have just if the Cisco I know would have jumped in a defiant instantly upon hearing the news. Well, but that's Starfleet orders, I'm sure, because A, taking the defiant away from the wormhole with the Dominion threat, I'm sure is not something that the Federation wants him ever to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, taking it into a war zone and mm. risking it in these other things like... You know, you don't you don't just like hop on your if you're in the US military, you don't just like hop and take your battleship into a war zone without orders. That's Ben Cisco's kid over there, buddy. Yeah, well, I mean he does it. <laughs> so if I'm not mistaken, he jumped into a mirror universe warship haphazardly and ran a whole attack mission. Yeah, well but uh, he doesn't care about Jake in the other universe. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> okay. I mean in that universe he has he has uh 
incentive to go over there, if you know what I'm saying. The uh-huh. dax of it. <laughs> well, and his, yeah, and his, his ex-wife wife. and his... <laughs> I mean, C- Cisco is... You know, the mirror universe is kind of like the holodeck. Like, anything goes. It's a much hornier place than the real mm-hmm. world. Anyway. So, uh, on the planet, Jake and Bashir have dinner ready. But once Bashir makes a joke about performing surgery on the food, Jake immediately pukes. Understandably, with the trauma that he's gone through. Later, Jake asks Bashir about the soldier who shot himself in the foot. Bashir assumes he'll be court-martialed. Jake doesn't understand. He's in Starfleet. They have psych tests. They've spent hundreds of hours in battle simulations. And Bashir naturally says, this is no simulation. He goes in to check on a patient, and he talks with the female doctor. She asks what was going on in the war. Her husband is serving on one of the lead ships in the battle. Uh, Not the Farragut, which they don't know has been destroyed yet, but the other one. And Kirby says, you know what I heard? The ship the Starfleet sent, the Farragut, the Klingons intercepted it. Jake says, Starfleet will send another one, won't they? Kirby says, it won't be here for days. In the meantime, we're looking at a ground war, which is what the Klingons want. According to a lieutenant I talked to, they've got so many transport scramblers online, we can't beam troops anywhere. What about using hoppers? He said the Klingons have been shooting them out of the sky, left and right. Unless something changes, he figures the Klingons will capture the settlement the day after tomorrow. And I think the, the directions here are interesting. The Satrum says Kirby doesn't come off as overtly frightened by this. In fact, by telling Jake what he knows, he's venting some of his own anxiety and comes off a bit breathless, almost excited by it all. Great stage directions. Fantastic yeah. stage directions. Which is why I'm thinking that sort of exasperation is what made me suspect of everybody. Yeah, the sort of he's venting their own anxiety. So he continues, did you see the Batleth wounds today? The Klingons get mad, they forget about their disruptors and go hand to hand. At least we won't have to worry about them. He says, "Eh, don't be so sure. Medical personnel are fair game as far as the Klingons are concerned. They'll even kill the wounded right in their beds. They think they're giving them an honorable death or something. Um, Again, like, continuing to reinforce just how visceral and ugly this is. And uh, Kirby asks Jake what he's doing here. And Jake continues in voiceover. He says, I he, I wonder if he knew the whole time he was talking, all I was thinking about how close the Klingons were. Later that night, there's a rumbling and the power goes out. We hear that it's going to be three hours before the power comes back on. They can't get any portable generators because they're keeping the shields up, but Bashir realizes that the runabout has one. But they can't beam there. They're going to have to sneak through a tunnel past the perimeter of protection. Bashir and Jake leave the tunnel and venture outside and start getting shelled. They run around as explosions happening all around them. And Bashir says, whatever happens, one of us has to get to the generator. So uh, these explosions, practical explosions, every one of them, which is pretty cool, all over the place. And Bashir is knocked out and Jake panics and starts running away. So in Act 3, in his panic, Jack Jake accidentally runs straight into a battlefield strewn with the dead Klingons and dead Federation troops. And this feels very World War I. You know, trenches and open battlefields just littered with corpses. He lands on a dead Klingon, then falls down a hill in a pretty impressive looking stunt. Uh, with uh, and and did did a good job of masking Jake's stunt double too. Mm-hmm. I thought that was, thought that was pretty good. And he immediately gets punched in the face by a Federation soldier who's horribly wounded. He takes a hypo spray and asks if there are any Klingons or Starfleet around. He gives Jake some water and he immediately does what every TV film person does when water is scarce. He f- spills it everywhere while drinking. Uh, also, uh, it's another sci-fi trope, right? But, like, the packet of water that he had there for his rations was, like, two ounces of water. And I don't think we've invented, like, sci-fi water that is extra thirst-quenching with a much smaller piece of it. Brought to you by uh, Crime! There's, there's this great joke on Space Quest. Remember that game? Mm-hmm. 
uh, where you one of the resources Roger is dehyd- Was it Roger Wilco? Roger Wilco oh. in Space Quest. Yep. Oh, uh, but uh, he, this great gag where like one of your resources is dehydrated water. That's hilarious. Good. So uh, I've always wanted to invent dry water, right? When you get a shower, like the worst part about getting a shower sometimes is you don't want to get wet, right? And you're even cold or whatever. So it's just if you have the dry water, you don't get wet. On Star Trek, it's called a sonic shower, buddy. Love it, baby. Yeah. So uh, we find out that this guy, Burke, stayed behind to help his comrades get away during a Klingon attack. But this whole time, he's clearly mortally wounded. He screams in pain again. And his hypo is out. Jake says, then I'll carry you. Kid, you can try picking me up, but my guts will wind up all over your shoes. But I've got to try to do something. I've got to try. Forget it. And in the stage direct says, Jake is so bent on convincing himself that redemption is possible, he doesn't consider what he's admitting. He says, but I have to. This way, it'll all make sense. I ran for a reason so that I could find you and bring you back and save your life ran from the explosions we had to get the runabout for the generator but when the shelling started i couldn't see the dr bashir and the explosions kept getting closer and i had to run to get out of here so i ran i ran and i kept running until i found you I ran so far away. sorry so what <laughs> keith's not even phased you. by my weird just like oh, random I, 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 r- I, random neurons firing <laughs> it's just like when I go to therapy. So I, a little bit peek behind the curtain quickly. Mm. My therapist and I often, I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very stream of consciousness, very much like a friend of the show, JD. And so we do this thing very often when I'm in that type of mood where I just, I literally lay on the couch or on my couch and she'll just feed me prompt words that I will then mm. like tangent on and then she'll pick another word from that and we'll tangent somewhere else and and thus a lot of times that's just what I'm doing on the show. <laughs> it, it sounds almost like it's a it's a variation on EMDR. It's yeah, not not Take it, pieces it's in on that it. world, yeah. 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 Anyway, uh yes, that's 100% what it's like talking to you. Uh but thematically, right? This now becomes about Jake's guilt. Yes. And his and his feeling of his like profound guilt that he had for abandoning Bashir here. And what I really like in that stage direction, and it's apparent here, he's desperately trying to find a way to make this to make it okay to not have to own the fact that he abandoned Bashir and abandoned the mission. And it's I think it's really well done. Um, from his performance, I think I think this is Sarek's best performance of the series. Oh, we'll far. get into that with my thoughts, and I want to plant the seed of this also. You know, just because of a lot of the therapy work and and upon I to be full disclosure, I had to watch this episode again because when I watched it with the patrons last night, uh, I was feeling very flip, and uh, then seeing the episode, I realized it had a little more gravity to it, and so I had to kind of watch it with a little more of a grounding for myself and what I thought was interesting is that you know yes things happen in the moment and yes I think his guilt was very much based on feeling like he abandoned Bashir but also we all know that our trauma and stuff goes much further back and I wondered if his guilt goes further back to his decision to not be in Starfleet and you're always living Mm. in the shadow of your parents and his dad being this very heroic figure and has done so many heroic things and in his one battle test he runs like a baby and that's why I in his head I'm not commenting on my judgment of him right and that's why I think the last scene is actually so good he has a great line in that last scene we'll get to where he says I wasn't sure if I wanted you to read this um, yeah, because who is his ultimate? It, I mean, it's I mean, God is, is he exposing the his deepest darkest? And if you if you go even further back, right? His mom. I right? think the point about not joining, yeah, his mom. And like, even though it makes absolutely no sense, how could a little boy protect his mother from the freaking Borg? Mm-hmm. But guess what? That's not how our brains work. Nope. And. You know the, the that he's probably feeling guilt or shame about not protecting his mom. 
Hey, dude, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you straight up now, just to go to tangent. There was a time when my dad was sick that, you know, he had to be. It was twice a day, three times a day, twice a day. We had to take him to the hospital for dialysis twice a day, right? Mm. And so, my brother and I and my mom. However, we would divvy up how we would get him there because he wasn't easy transport. He was kind of a pain in the butt. Very obstinate. And this one time, it, it fell to me to do by myself, and I'm trying to get him from the passenger seat to his like wheelchair thing to get him into the hospital and he whatever whatever happened i couldn't grab him he fell down and he like shattered his wrist right and mm. to like dust and like till till the re- for the rest of his time which wasn't long he just had like a broken arm because he couldn't couldn't fix it and i was like 18 years old 17 years old however old i am i shouldn't have been in that situation the sh- shoulda woulda coulda shoulda woulda the, uh, my right. adult self gives us a make lot of sick. grace yeah it's not like i yeah. broke his arm but damned if i don't carry that with me and when my mom fell the other day i wasn't even there it had nothing to do with me didn't it bring me right back to sure. that feeling of i didn't wasn't i dropped my dad right it's like our brains are yeah. weird and we take every opportunity to make ourselves just monstrous to give our well and and i you know I don't want to get real far into uh, really far into therapy, right? We want to believe that we could have or should have prevented or protected because guilt is a lot easier than helplessness. And realizing yeah, there's something yeah. I could have done, yeah. and and like it is much easier to be like, oh, I'm a I'm a, I'm the bad guy, I'm the monster, I really screwed up, than just like shit happens. Interestingly, and and I I just can't shake this. Jake's perform or Cyrix's performance, I think, like you said, captures so many of the colors we're discussing right now. Yeah. Unfortunately, juxtaposed to this other dude in the scene, who's just like, this is my scene in Star Trek, and I'm about to tear it all down. <laughs> uh, it leaves a little something to be desired for me. He 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 goes hard. <laughs> Uh, I I will I will admit I don't say uh, nuance is a word that enters the scene. I mean, but look, he's also mortally wounded, traumatized, and in a battle. But he, it's 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 a lot. I think were I directing, I would have been like, great, give me forty percent of make make eighty percent of that subtext. <laughs> uh, and like, wasn't is there no? There's not like an age limit in the like soldiers of Drek? <laughs> like, why is this dude on the front lines, man? Dude, it's Starfleet. There is no age discrimination in uh-huh. Starfleet. Like, nobody wants me and you uh, in the battle. No, thank thank God. <laughs> Let like, alone, like, draft, uh, ten years like, older than us. When the draft inevitably comes because we refuse to support Ukraine and we have right, to right. go to World War Three. You and I would be like, ah, good, good luck, children. Fight hard. Well, we've yeah, got some hard. podcasts to do. <laughs> we'll mention you in the Patreon feed. All right. Yeah. Anyway, wow, that was dark. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. So then he dies, <laughs> and Jake sits there in horror, understandably. Mm-hmm. So in Act 4, on the Defiant, Cisco is in the Jeffrey's tube. He's trying to keep busy and keep his mind off Jake while they warp to the rescue. Actually, go go back one and show uh, one more so we can sort of keep going. Yeah, right there. So the battle, the battle damage mm-hmm. in that uniform is great. And also, you know, go, going back to 90s sensors, right? Because the uniform is black and it's sort of messy, we imply blood mm-hmm. without show because it's sort of like dark and slick with his blood, but we don't see a great deal of it. And I think that's a very creative way to get around the censorship because you couldn't, if he had a white uniform and all of that was blood, there's no way they would have let you have that happen. Keith, bear with me. Sorry to mm-hmm. completely shit on your point, but if you were to take a battle damage Riker. And a Luke Skywalker from the last Today. movie, right? <laughs> right? And did a head swap. You got this guy. There, that, there you go. Well, I guarantee you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming probably Josh, but 
maybe JD, some of, uh, some of our customizers have a figure of this guy. And probably using the uh, the Riker <laughs> battle, the, the oddly battle damaged Riker figure. All right. So, uh, anyway, Cisco's trying not to freak out on the bridge. Dax knows what it's like to worry about a child. Great scene. And she, Great scene. She Terry's tells, so good. Yeah. She tells the story of how scared she was as a father desperately reading a book to her sick daughter. And I wrote down, Terry does a terrific job with this monologue. Um, and it's a really good scene. It's just really, it's written really well. It's performed really well. Interestingly, um, I'll save it, actually. Forget it. All right. Uh, no, but I'll like, say no. Whatever. Because <laughs> it doesn't fit. Anyway. I almost feel like, and I love Avery. Mm-hmm. And you get it a sense of it in that scene with, with Odo. But I almost feel like Terry's performance in this scene, Dax's performance in this scene, is the parental fear and angst I wanted to get more of a sense from Avery in this episode. Uh, and I, here, I'm going to fix it for you okay. right friggin' now. Two reasons. One, Cisco is in trauma. Mm-hmm. This anxiety, th- this is like happening right now. And so, speaking for myself, when I'm in my trauma response, I feel nothing. Mm-hmm. Right? My emergency mode emotional response is to feel nothing. I will feel it Three or four days later, when I, like I flip out over nothing and I don't understand why. Whereas Dax is recalling something that's in the past, so she's allowed access to those emotions because the danger has passed. And I imagine that for Cisco, maybe after his last scene with Jake, after Jake goes to bed, then it's going to hit him emotionally. Mm-hmm. I totally, one hundred percent, agree with all that. My issue is that we have 45 minutes and we're trying to tell a story. And so it, if the story is that dad is really freaking out over all this, I need to see dad freak out a little bit. Oh, but I think that would be too on the nose. And it, Cut if to criticism the scene we of just this, came to. Right. So if your criticism of this episode is it's too on the nose, then you're saying it's not on the nose enough. No. Make up your mind, it's sir. It's not that it's too on the nose. We'll get to my criticism when the time comes. <laughs> Oh, God, look, I'm bleeding. I've got red and black all over me. So, uh, (laughs) anyway, they both decide to busy themselves with tasks to deal with their anxiety. We go back to the caves, and Kirby checks on a patient when Jake stumbles in by surprise. Uh, He survived and made his way back. He asks about Bashir, and apparently Bashir has been badly wounded, but was able to carry the generator back by himself to more crippling guilt. Jake lies and says that he was knocked out during the attack and got lost, as opposed to just ran. Jake goes to Bashir, who was incredibly relieved that Jake wasn't killed, and he apologizes for bringing him into these conditions. But Jake can't hear an apology from Bashir when he's feeling so guilty. Thus, they are both feeling intense guilt towards each other without really clocking each other's guilt. But Jake continues in voiceover. I keep turning it over in my head, the shelling, losing sight of Bashir, running, and I keep trying to make sense of it all to justify what I did, but when it comes down to it, there's only one explanation. I'm a coward. Later, Jake is asked to bring food to the soldier who shot his own foot. They're both feeling the shame. Jeb makes a joke about his good aim shooting his own foot. And he appreciates that Jake is the only person here not looking at him like a bug, because he now can relate. Jake says, maybe there won't be a court-martial. Starfleet could decide to send you to counseling instead. And it says, I won't go. I don't deserve to be in Starfleet. Therapy won't change what I did. Nothing can. I just wish I'd aimed the phaser a little higher. Dark. That's, and, you know, and, of all the stuff, Keith, it's interesting. Of all the things you've mentioned about the the blood and the bodies and all that stuff, this mention, and I know we had a moment not not too long ago where there was like a suicide reference mm. with a phaser. 
uh, what episode was that? They were in the storage room. Oh, oh it was Colm. Oh, Kern. Colm. What oh, Colm, yes. After well, the Kern, prison Kern thing? wanted to kill himself. And, mm -hmm. and yes, you're absolutely right. But for some reason, this so one, this one, in regards to sort of PTSD, in regards to shame, in regards to all that, struck me. That's this is the moment of the episode that struck me with that. Okay, we're we're not in Kansas anymore. Vibe, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it really is, and I think the the dovetailing of their two experiences here and Jake's having a completely different context for the same man saying the same things very quickly. How how war changes con context like that, and interestingly, this is the scene. They scrambled to add to the episode. Yeah, and which, because makes, they were, which, they ran which short. makes my next next point more deliberate, right? I thought it was an interesting choice in the edit, before knowing that the scene was added, that they chose never to show anyone else really ridiculing him too much. So that this scene, mm. when he's saying that to Jake, there's sort of two stories you could take, right? It's either that, yes, we are just we just chose not to show it and people have been kind of side-eyeing him and he's feeling, or he's inventing that experience and just assuming that people's responses to him is mm. because he's a coward because he's feeling that in intrinsic shame. I thought it was interesting. And I, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, because right. Because we definitely see Bashir react with disgust once he figures out what's happened. And we see it from Jake a little bit too. A little in bit, that, yeah. Both in that first scene. But yeah, I imagine it's both imagined and real for him in this moment. Uh, but again, it, it's it's great. So later we see the doctors having a gallows conversation about how they want to die when the Klingons reach the compound. But Jake is not having it. He's starting to crack up. And Bashir takes him for a walk. He can tell that something is eating at Jake. But Jake won't talk to him, and he leaves. And this heartbreakingly leaves Jake alone who collapses on the floor and sobs. And again, great performance from Sarek here, for sure. So Act 5 begins, Jake is curled up on the floor when the attack inevitably starts. We hear rumbling and the lights flicker. It's time to evacuate. They're going to have to move patients through a two-kilometer tunnel. Everybody springs to action, but Jake cowers under a table. The roof starts to collapse, and he runs. Brief and he runs. He's briefly protected by a couple of Federation soldiers, but the Klingons arrive and kill both of them. And in a moment of desperation, from under the table, Jake takes the phaser rifle and fires wildly, which causes the ceiling to collapse, blocking off the Klingons and saving the day, but not intentionally. Jake wakes up with Bashir and his father standing over him. The ceasefire has been reinstated and Jake survived. Jake saved the day by sealing off the tunnel. And Jake, and they say, hey, good job. You did this whole thing. You did something heroic. But Jake says in voiceover, more than anything, I wanted to believe what he was saying. But the truth is, I was just as scared in that hospital as I'd been when we went for the generator. So scared that all I could think about was doing whatever it took to stay alive. Once that meant running away, and once it meant picking up a phaser. The Battle of Agilian Prime will probably be remembered as a pointless skirmish, but I'll always remember it as something more, as the place I learned that the line between courage and cowardice is a lot thinner than most people would believe. And this is when we reveal Cisco reading the article that Jake wrote. Jake says, so, what did you think? And Cisco says, anyone who's been in battle would recognize himself in this. But most of us wouldn't care to admit it. He studies Jake's features, wants him to understand. It takes courage to look inside yourself, and even more courage to write about it for other people to see. I'm proud of you, son. And I wrote, okay, fine, you got me, I'm crying. And yeah. that is the end of this episode. Yeah, like one of my favorite things that's emerged is, this is probably the second or third time we've done it, but when Jake has written something and Ben reads it, which is very vulnerable as we know, but also then has like a commentary on it, a parenting moment, 
a philosophical moment. And, you know, and a lot of shows do that. I, I always point to Full House. You know, Full House, there's always that last five minutes where the, viol- the violins kick in and there's like Danny Tanner goes down to a knee and he explains the, the moral principle of the episode. Yeah. Ostensibly, that's what this is. However, because of their relationship, because of Avery Brooks's acting, because of the like very poignant writing usually in these moments, they work so well and really put a fine point on it. And uh, this is another one. Nails it. Just made it all, made it really work. And it really brings home the use of that device, which we haven't seen before. And I, w- I was not, I won't say fully skeptical, but just like, hmm, about in the top of the episode. But this really was like, yep, give me more of that. Because it's, uh, it's great. I love those scenes. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's great to see Jake developing as a writer. He's a really good writer. Yeah. I mean, this is very, very well written. Um and, and I think that the other thing this episode does is a little bit a thing for the end here, but uh, whatever, it's in my brain, is most of the time this episode would finish with Jake actually doing something heroic. Mm. Like him finding his courage and then really saving the day for everybody. But this episode, but it, that would kind of be pulling the punch. Mm. Right? This episode's like, yeah, no. Jake is not somebody who, like, musters up courage in a battle. That's not who he is. The type of courage Jake has is in his honesty and vulnerability and willingness to tell a story like that, which is what what, what Cisco says. But it's it, it both... Um, there, there is no classic redemption. Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna kill the bad guy. He's really brave in the end. But the, the redemption is in his clearly having chosen the right path. He's not a soldier. He shouldn't be in Starfleet. What he is is a writer, mm-hmm. and there's something profoundly heroic in that. It's just heroic in a different way. And I love the fact that this episode doesn't neuter that by making him a hero at the end. And 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 you know it, it, classical like punch punch hero, he makes him a, a writing hero, and I and I I love that. It's so so much smarter and aimed higher than than a lot of things. So uh, I'm halfway through my my stem bolts, but before we do that, let's let's do our little thing. All right, Mikey, did you have any wormholes in yeah, the plot? We've talked about them throughout the episode, so I will not be labor. I thought that, you know, uh, the the Ben's attitude of it all was felt a little incongruous to me, but you had some really insightful comments on that. Uh, the fact that we didn't just, like, jump in and try to go... Any other episode, we would have jumped in that defiant and raced over there ourselves but Mm -hmm. plot plot we couldn't do that uh so you know but nothing further than that you know we talked about it so i won't be labor yeah Uh, my my only wormhole is the is the the production wormhole why why we couldn't set this on cardassia and like why why in the context of what we know about the Federation and the Klingons and Gowron, why are we having this horrible, bloody battle between the Federation and the Klingons? Like, I get it, they're in conflict, but, like, I feel like that would have some pretty big repercussions. Yeah, but also, and also they, get to, they get to, oh, the, the, the ceasefire is reinstated because dot, dot, dot. Why? Why was well, it we broken knew, in the first he, he, place? Well, I, actually, here. Here's how I'm going to fix it. So, in a lot of ways, this parallels World War I. And, and is, a, is a Star Trek take on All Quiet in the Western Front. Well, what is the climactic cl- the climax of All Quiet in the Western Front? It's based on a real-life battle that happened in World War I after they'd signed the treaty to end the war. They said we're going to end the war at noon at noon today, and one more battle happened after they'd already signed the ceasefire that killed 
thousands of people because a German commander was like, we got to go out swinging. And all of these people died utterly unnecessarily in another brutal, bloody, horrific battle. And so this is kind of the version of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we know this is wrapping up. We know that we're finishing this. But, like, we have one more battle just because humanity. So maybe that's what it is. Okay. Let's talk best moment. Man, there's so I'm gonna praise him later. I, I'm gonna pick for my best moment. Maybe we should change the favorite moment. It's hard just because it's anyway. Point being, yeah, best favorite, best. Yeah, to I you. really liked so much about the Ben Odo scene. I liked so much about the end scene. Mm-hmm. Those are probably the best. But my favorite, I think, was the was the Dax scene. The Dax mm. because it's just so interesting. Dax as a father, right, and Terry selling a very father experience right not like through the through the analogy of motherhood but no like direct first person experience through the 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 trill of it all i thought it was cool really great performance she never ceases to amaze me uh so i'm gonna pick that yeah i i think i'm gonna pick kind of what i just said and that is allowing jake's heroism to be through vulnerability and his writing. Um, I just think it's it's much more interesting. It's much more Star Trek. Um, and I think it, this is such a... You said not in Kansas anymore, right? This Like a loss of innocence. This is Jake's emergence into adulthood. And, and showing that adult Jake is a profoundly different person than adult Ben. And but they they both have tremendous courage and heroism and wisdom, but they're just very different. And I love the fact that they chose to have Jake grow up not to be a mini Cisco, mm-hmm. but to be his own completely different man. And I think that speaks to how good Ben is as a father. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna see this story continue, right? Like, who is Jake as an adult? Who is this character? Who is this man now? And and to have him be very different from everybody else on the show, because most of the people we know are in Starfleet, are in some form of military, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's Bajoran military or Starfleet military, um, you know, and even the doctor, he's still in the military, right? A true civilian in this world is really fascinating. And so and so I I just love this development of Jake. And I love the story of Jake here. So that that's my best moment. Let's talk Stembolts, shall we? You get some Stembolts. Hell yeah, they are self-sealing. Here are some Stembolts for you. I remember the discourse when discussing The Visitor about mm-hmm. how it was kind of sad that, I mean, thank thank God we had Tony Todd, right, doing, doing Jake, and it was excellent, and him and Ben were yeah. incredible, and it was incredible. Loved that episode. But it kind of sucks that in such a pivotal story of father-son, we didn't get Sirik in there. Yeah. Yep. Well, here you go, right? I stand by my sort of feelings that some of this episode that were attempting to ground us into this dramatic battle-tested in the fog of war stuff just didn't quite land for me, be it too hyperbolic, be it not, be it too production-y or seti, I can't articulate it better than it just something didn't ground me in that reality. Mm-hmm. Which, in an episode that is so about that, could lead to it just not working at all. However, Jake Sisko, more importantly, Sirik Lofton here, came into his own as an actor 
and showed yeah. me that he can carry the entire episode. Even in scenes where one of the characters was in a different play, in my my opinion. Sirik knew the reality. He knew his journey. He knew what the story we were telling was. His performance was was intrinsic. It was subtle. It was it was overt when it had to be. So many colors. He showed me much more of a palette of what he is capable of than I've seen before. And even his delivery of the VO, it, I believed in in the narrative that this is him, this is Jake writing this stuff, which is yeah, not easy to yeah. pull off. It's not something you think about much, right? They tell you, oh, he wrote it, but it, you know, it, it worked. He, he made this episode work as far as the reservations I've had and for even my kind of like just feeling you derive from me watching it that all stands but there comes times when an actor can pull you through it and he made it all work for me so this is one of those opportunities just like renee has done on a few occasions and and avery and everyone really this is one that is i will remember for this performance i will remember mm. for this performance and him telling this story because i bought it also shout out to sidig too who i think did yeoman's work mm. in showing the colors that were necessary in in you know just that one scene where he is also feeling the shame also feeling the ramifications of his decisions to bring jake into that situation it was really powerful those scene that so if you just take you know i i know i had some comments about i also just felt like a, a lot of the the middle area where we're feeling it's sort of the montage, right? The training montage of them growing frustrated and growing. And obviously, the, I'm sorry, I'm talking in shorthand. There was a lot of limitations and we never see a lot of the battles. It's just a lot of hearing. Whereas last week right. we did that right. too. But a lot of it felt short for me. But the performances and the character beats told the story to me, uh, which is cool. Right, because they had it coming from both sides. Right, I appreciate all that you've said, and you have the perspective of having seen it in real time. And so I can imagine in real time when you're getting both the performance and that feeling of oh, we've turned a page in how we're going to 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 show dark things. Uh, it's probably even more heightened. That all said, I did not think this stunk. And just like I predicted at the end of the watch along, I do end up liking it much more than I think my takeaway was in the moment. I was feeling very meh, and I'm feeling pretty. So that said, 89 self-sealing stem bolts. Feeling yeah. good about it. Yeah, I, I I think all of that's fair. I mean, I think that the 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 limitations of this episode are clear, right? And and I and I think it's it's clearly demonstrated by the remake on Strange New Worlds. And I really think it is an overt reference to this mm -hmm. episode. Did we talk about that when we talked about that episode? I mentioned it, but you didn't have the context right. for it. So, mm -hmm. like, how how could you? Um, and so, what the Strange New World episodes could do that this one was not able to do is to go darker. Mm -hmm. Both, you know, and I mean that, like... Like, it's gorier, it's whatever. You could just go harder on that kind of stuff, like which I, I think this episode would have benefited from, but you're not allowed to. <laughs> it's darker, literally, that the, the resolution and aspect ratio and technology of the time did not allow them to light this as dark as I would have it be. Because these are this is playing on inconsistent tube televisions in mm -hmm. 1996 yeah this is why 90s television is so overlit because you don't have the the depth of color and tone that contemporary televisions can handle they just couldn't handle it right so it had to be too bright right and and i would have loved for it to be darker more visceral i would have loved more handheld camera footage and some of that's the direction like, I think this should have been shot handheld the whole time, you know. And so you have some limitations of 1996. You have some limitations of Star Trek that sort of pull the punches a little bit compared to how it would be done today. However, 
like I said before, in the context of 1996 and in the context of Star Trek, this is way heavier hitting than we've really seen before. This is this is pretty this is really dark and really hard hard for Star Trek up until this point. And and so I think like out of context, I think you're right. A little overlit, a little overdone, a little heavy-handed sometimes. In context, I remember we're watching it's like holy shit, what just happened on Star Trek? Yeah. Um and I think that that is that's important. A couple of things that I did like about the direction of this episode, very little music. It's it has music a little bit here and there, but there's a lot of this takes place in silence. <laughs> you and I keep fighting over the crop of me. I keep adjusting, you keep adjusting. Eventually just going to be I like my eyeball. Though I think where the score is is very orchestral it's and warm. it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. Um so uh this episode sticks out to me. I remember this episode. Um and there's and there's a few that were that are coming up that are going to be in this vein, right? Um uh, but this is the first time we're like, "Oh, oh, we're going to do real war." And, you know, as real war as you can in 90s television. So, I agree with you. I think the criticisms of this are fair. Um I think that the performances are a little inconsistent. I wish that they could have done some things a little bit their instincts were going in the right direction. I would have liked if they'd gone a little bit further. But I think in the big picture, I think it's a very strong episode. I think it's stronger than what people think about it. It's on IMDb, it's 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 7.5. It's only 84 out of 173. So it's just barely above average. Mm. Uh and the rating. I think it's more important than that, and I think it's better than that. Um so for me, it gets 91 self-sealing stem bolts just because like i remember it from all this like oof here it comes so that's what it gets for me next week we are talking about the assignment uh we're going to be introducing some new interesting lore next week uh buckle up and then uh one week after that we're doing tribbles and tribulations so uh we will don't worry, on our Patreon feed, we will be watching Trouble with Tribbles. Uh, Which I believe is going to be this Friday, is our goal. This Friday. Will we be we'll doing be that doing live, that. Keith, or is that a can it? I mean, we can. All right, so keep patrons. Keep your eyes peeled yeah. on the feed. We'll let you know. Yeah, we will be doing that. So uh, lots of fun stuff. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be, we'll be back here next week. Check out... Another scintillating episode of Star Trek Toys on Sunday, as always. And, uh, yeah, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash K&M. This has been fun. I think it's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for watching and participating. Uh, yeah, we'll see you back next week, week with another episode of Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching K&M Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash knm. <laughs>